Good afternoon, and welcome to the Atlantic Council. My name is Ian Brzezinski, and I'm a senior fellow here at the Council Scowcroft Center on Strategy and Security. Welcome to our session, Strengthening Alliances, a conversation with the Honorable Heather Wilson, Secretary of the United States Air Force. Over the last three decades, the armed forces of the United States have operated in a state of constant full combat readiness. They deter aggression in North Korea, from North Korea. They ensure freedom of navigation on the South China Sea. In Europe, they stand forward against a revanchist Russia. They fight extremism and terrorism in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. The United States Air Force has been a critical element of US military operations in each of these theaters and many others. Like its companion services, the U.S. Air Force operates in an environment that is global in scope and whose challenges are increasingly complex and demanding and lethal. Today, it must address not only counterinsurgency and counterterrorism operations, but also the increasing probability, possibility, of high-intensity conflict against significant powers. To ensure the Air Force's success in the missions of today and to prepare that force for the battles of the future, our 24th Secretary of the Air Force has outlined five priorities for her service. Readiness, cost-effective modernization, innovation, development of exceptional leadership, and the strengthening of alliances. That last priority is our focus this afternoon. In the world I just described, the need for allies and partners has only grown. But so is the diplomatic and operational challenges of fostering and sustaining militarily effective alliances that exercise the highest form of commitment, the deployment of forces to combat, a readiness to shed blood, in defense of shared interests and values. We will benefit from Secretary Wilson's perspective on the significance and potentials of military-to-military -military relationships. To her position, she brings defense, international, and political experience almost custom designed for the responsibilities she has as leading, she has leading the U.S. Air Force. Indeed, aviation is embedded deeply in her DNA. Born in Keene, New Hampshire, she is the daughter of a commercial pilot and the granddaughter of a Scottish pilot who flew in both world wars, emigrated to the United States, and sustained his pilot skills as a barnstormer. The United States Air Force Academy started accepting female applicants when Heather Wilson was a junior in high school. She applied, she was accepted, and she graduated as vice wing commander, as a distinguished graduate, and as a Rhodes Scholar. As an Air Force officer, she experienced firsthand the value of alliances serving in the United Kingdom and as a defense planner at NATO. She served on the National Security Council staff as a director for European Defense Policy and Arms Control. After she left the Air Force, Heather Wilson was appointed as New Mexico's Secretary of Children, Youth, and Family. Then she was elected to Congress where she served for over a decade and was an active member of the House Intelligence Committee and the House Armed Services Committee. Before returning to the Air Force in her current capacity, she served as the president of the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City. What a compelling life story of public service. Air Force officer, Rhodes Scholar, military planner, White House staffer, state secretary, congresswoman, university president, and now secretary of the Air Force. Before I turn the floor over to Secretary Wilson, let me just note that her remarks will be followed by a conversation with Christine Wormuth, uh, director of the Adrian Arts Center of Resilience here at the Council. And those of you who know uh, Christine know that she served in numerous high positions in the White House and Pentagon, most recently as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. We are live tweeting this event from the Scowcroft Center account at AC Scowcroft, and we're using the hashtag, hashtag AC Defense. It's my pleasure to turn the floor over to the Honorable Heather Wilson, Secretary of the Air Force. Well, Ian, thank you very much, and thank thank all of you for for being here this afternoon. I uh, actually my first contact with the Atlantic Council was when I was at NATO a long time ago as a young officer, and I was a uh, I was amazed. I, there was a fellow who came to visit NATO and and stayed for a time with us, and and. Um, 
Uh, and uh, it was amazing to me, having grown up in a small town in New Hampshire and then went to the, to the Air Force Academy in graduate school, was I, I couldn't understand that uh, actually he could do, he did this thinking stuff full time. It was just amazing that, that there, were, there were places that you could do that. Um, so thank you to the Atlantic Council for, for all the council has done over the years to continue to maintain a strong connection with our, with our allies uh, across the Atlantic. Um, the Secretary of Defense says something frequently that I think bears is, uh, is worth repeating, and that is that countries with allies thrive and those without wither. Um, that is, that is uh, true in all points of history, but I think particularly now in an era where the world is more complex and dangerous than we have seen in decades. Um, and in that kind of context, our allies and partners become even more important than they are in an era uh, of, of single party or single country domination. That reemergence of great power competition presents us with a new and more challenging security environment than we have faced in decades. And the new national defense strategy published in January was crafted specifically to navigate this very new environment and to, to guide the services to change their focus from the, from the violent and extremist organization fight that we've been in for the last 27 years towards this area, era of reemerged great power competition. One example of how the Air Force is grappling with that change is really networked, what we, uh, an area we call battle management. It's command and control in a battle environment which has traditionally fallen to the Air Force as one of our core missions. The way we have done this in the past is off of a single aircraft. Um, in the, when I was on the National Security Council staff in 1991, uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And at the time, there was a company that was uh, developing under a contract for, for, with at the Defense Department a new capability. It was a Boeing 707 aircraft crammed with electronics in the back and about 30, uh, 30 people. And what they could do with a, they had built this uh, onto the belly of this Boeing 707, a synthetic aperture radar that looked out sideways and could see 150, 200 miles off the side of the aircraft. The idea was that they would fly around in a, in an oval overhead of the army on the ground and look out in front of the army to see who was out there and to be able to call in strikes against any, see who is in front of the United States Army. And they, the intention was to develop this capability really for the North German plane. We were at a time in, in our history where the biggest threat we faced was the, uh, the prospect of the, the, uh, the Soviet Union coming across the Fulda Gap and being able to see where they were so that we could mostly call in air power to destroy them before they moved was, was what we were all about. And it was a revolutionary new capability. And it's hard to imagine now, but at the time we were facing Saddam Hussein in Kuwait, one of the things we were most afraid of was fratricide, was air power destroying our own troops on the ground. And what this revolutionary capability called J-STARS was able to, to distinguish between American forces and, and uh, adversary forces on the ground. It wasn't even in the inventory yet, and, uh, and the president and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense at the time uh, pushed it into the fight with contractors on the back end, and it arrived one day before the start of operations against, uh, against Saddam Hussein. It continued to be a very important capability and is today. We use it in the Middle East. You think about it, back in 1991, when I was on the National Security Council staff, um, 1991 was two years before uh, the first 20-ounce mobile phone was came into into being. Remember those? They look. They look, so 20 ounces, about the size of a bottle of Diet Coke you get out of the machine. You know, big big brick of a thing, and uh, and really expensive. It was also, I guess, it was 1993 when a company changed its name and it became AOL. And then a few years after that, they started mailing us those discs to put into computers. And and uh, and uh, I, it was a it, on the NSC staff at the White House. We didn't have email. Um, and we, had, we didn't have cell phones, we had pagers. We thought we were really cool, we had pagers that actually showed the number you were supposed to call. It was, it was a big deal. 
Technology has changed since 1991, and so is the threat. One of the things that we have to do um, is to think of battle management in a different way, because today, a new version of JSTARS can't get close enough to the forward edge of the battle area to be able to see 150 or 200 miles in front of the Army on day one because of the increased range of, of the surface-to-air threat. So we asked ourselves, how can we do this differently, given technology of today? Is there a better way in a highly contested environment so that we can operate not just in the Middle East over Syria or Iraq, but if required to do so in the South China Sea or over Eastern Europe? And the new way that we put forward to the Congress and is pending this year is called advanced battle management and requires us and, and leads us to build systems that would survive in contested domains by fusing data from multiple different um, points, uh, space, manned, unmanned in the air. All of us in this room have more sensors in our pockets today than we would have in a whole city block at the time that JSTARS was created. And so, so we think that there is a different way to solve the battle management problem, to fuse data from space, manned and unmanned air platforms to be able to see in front of the Army on day one of a contested fight so that we can protect them the way the Army expects us to do. The last time that an American Marine or soldier was killed on the ground by enemy aircraft was April 15th, 1953. We have an obligation to the United States Army to make sure that the airspace over their head is protected and to make sure that we're able to see in front of the Army um, so that they can, uh, they can protect themselves. So more generally, though, what does the national defense strategy mean for the Air Force? Um, one of the things it means, and the thing that you all have asked me to talk about today, is that we can compete and deter and win most effectively when we operate together with our allies. That means fortifying the transatlantic alliance. It means deepening our and building new alliances and partnerships around the world. In general, it means building on a foundation of mutual respect, of shared responsibility, and of accountability to each other. You know, when I was a young officer, we would very often refer to Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty and the obligation for mutual defense, that, for shared self-defense, um, and, and uh, that an attack on one will be considered an attack against us all. At that time, as a young officer, I never imagined that the time when that article would be called into service was not when Germany was attacked, but when America was attacked. And in the wake of 9-11, we called on Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty to have our allies help us. Sometimes these alliances work in ways that we perhaps don't anticipate when the alliances are put in, in place. So it is that foundation it also means expanding our regional consultative mechanisms in collaborative planning where it's needed. Now, I would say that in NATO and the North Atlantic Alliance, many of those mechanisms are highly refined, but there are other areas in the world where we have work to do on those consultative mechanisms and the collaborative planning. And the best thing about collaborative planning is that it gives you a place from which to divert when plans meet reality. It also means deepening the interoperability of our forces. So how does the Air Force fit into all of that? It is probably not a surprise to anyone in this room that it's very common for coalitions to come together first in the air. And the reason is that whenever there's a crisis somewhere, you know, the, the problems and the challenges that we face as the United States of the political problem of putting boots on the ground is, is the it's the same debate that takes place in other parliaments around the world. <clears throat> and as a result, it, it is not uncommon for countries to be able to be willing to commit air power when they may not be willing to put soldiers on the ground. And so as a consequence, it just you know, today in the fight against ISIS in the Middle East, um, Lieutenant General Cobra Harigian, who is the commander of the Air Forces in Central Command and of the, of, of the uh, coalition operation for the air, 
He has more than 30 countries that are part of the every morning's air tasking order. Over 30 countries participate. And sometimes it's funny how you get reminded of these things. You know, they're, they're, for those of you who have worked in the Pentagon before, this is, I've never worked, I've, I, I've avoided working in the Pentagon my entire career and, until this last year. And, uh, and one of the things you get is the, uh, the messages from the watch. And one of them uh, recently was a, a sandstorm that had come through unexpectedly uh, across uh, uh, one of our air bases. And, and this one happened to be in Jordan. And it knocked down a bunch of sunshades. Um, which is not a big deal unless there are aircraft under them, which become, you know, um, uh, mishaps when you damage an aircraft. And the thing that was amazing to me was we, uh, there are shun shades. They weren't our aircraft. And when they went down the list of uh, the operational impact, it is a coalition fight. And it sure showed up in, in whose aircraft got dinged. And then you kind of just want to look at your shoes on how we did not know about this uh, did not know about this windstorm that came through and knocked our sunshades into somebody else's aircraft. The Air Force has a very long history of working very closely with our allies around the world. The United States Air Force trains pilots and air crew from allies all over the world. Of course, the United States hosts the joint Euro-NATO Jet Pilot Training Center at Shepard Air Force Base in Texas. And for our American pilots, it is the premier school they want to really try to get into uh, because it is the, it is the best uh, undergraduate pilot training that we have in the United States. The Afghans train at Moody Air Force Base in Georgia. The Singapore Air Force flies their own F-15s at a Mountain Home Air Force Base in Idaho. So it's very common for, for the Air Force to be working closely with allies and partners. But I wanted to particularly highlight three initiatives that I think are making, um, ma making the United States and our allies safer uh, and are part of our response to the national defense strategy. The first is what we are doing with light attack aircraft. And light attack aircraft is an initiative that's an experiment. Uh, it's going into its second round of experiments this summer at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. And it's going to allow us to work more closely with our allies to fight against violent extremism and at a lower cost. We've been involved in 27 years of continuous combat operations that have has strained the United States Air Force and has strained our high-end and attack fleets. I saw recently there was a there was an article in one of the newspapers on what was going on in Afghanistan. It talked about an F-22 attacking and destroying a narcotics factory. We should not be using an F-22 to destroy a narcotics factory. You don't need a high-end stealth fighter to destroy a narcotics factory. It's not a particularly cost-effective way to combat violent extremism. We need different aircraft to fight in a global environment that's, that's very competitive um, than what we need to fight violent extremism. And so our light attack experiment is intended to, uh, intended to do two things. One is to demonstrate that Air Force acquisition can still go fast. The Chief of Staff of the Air Force signed out a one-page invitation to participate with four pages of requirements on the 5th of March. And by August, we had four aircraft at Holloman Air Force Base to test in five months. Um, we then did an initial test, down-selected to two aircraft, and we are conducting an experiment uh, right now at Holloman Air Force Base uh, looking at sustainment, um, sensor capability, uh, and, uh, and weapons capability on these two aircraft. It's an experiment. It's authorized by some new authorities that were given to us by the Congress. Um, but the other thing that we have done this summer is we said, you know, it's fine to have a platform, but a platform is, is a, an aircraft is really just a, set, a node on a network if it's going to be really powerful. And so in another four-month sprint, we said, uh, let's put a network on this light attack aircraft that connects it to something on the ground, a forward air controller, and to each other, and off of a satellite, and back to a command and control element that is completely exportable from the very beginning. So the network itself has value. So our, the intention here is to, to see if we can test and understand 
a system that's affordable and exportable and interoperable with partners and allies. So it is light attack that is coalition at the core. As we move into this next phase of this experiment, we are actually inviting our international partners to observe our experiment alongside us to give us feedback on how we might meet shared national objectives through a light attack procurement that is much lower cost than fourth or fifth generation air, airplanes, um, both to purchase and also to operate. The idea with light attack is these are just light turbo turboprop air, airplanes that can be flown instead of at 15, 20, 25, $30,000 an hour at less than $10,000 or $5,000 an hour in, uh, in operating and maintenance costs. And they can ride on an intelligence sharing and communications network that's designed to be shareable and exportable. So there are no limitations at all on our ability to share this and export it to partners and allies. So, one of the, so light attack is one example of where the national defense strategy is pushing us to develop low-end capabilities to be able to deal with violent extremism at lower levels of cost so that we use high-end capabilities to prepare for great power competition, to do it in concert with allies and partners. But there, is a, there are other things that we are driv doing driven by the national defense strategy. And the second one that I wanted to highlight for you is really one of the unsung heroes of defense cooperation. And it grew out of the collapse of the former Soviet Union. It is called the State Partnership Program. It is run by the National Guard, and it establishes military relationships between individual state guards and other countries. The first of those three relationships was established in 1993 with nations that were formerly part of the Soviet Union who were trying to stand up their own military forces, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Today, there are 74 security relationships around the globe between state guards and other countries. These are enduring partnerships that are built on mutual respect and trust and understanding. Um, they have really made tremendous contributions to de the development of allies and partners. And it, it has developed gradually over time. To me, it, is, it was, it was a, a brilliant idea at the time, in part because there's such tremendous stability in the National Guard. Unlike the active force, where if you're partnered with the the, um, the uh, 94th Fighter Squadron, well, there's a different commander there and completely different people every two or three years. And there's no sense of continuity. But the partnership with a guard is decades long and can lead to the kinds of, uh, the kinds of relationships um, that, uh, that are a lot easier to create at the state level uh, than perhaps they are at the, at the national level. So our guards train together, share equipment, commit to joint action over years and decades. They sometimes have deployed together um, into combat zones. Uh, and, uh, and this builds the kind of trust and confidence and ultimately alliances that, that uh, stand the tests of time. They also evolve over time, as countries have evolved over time, as they have built stronger militaries, advanced interoperability. Uh, we've seen them migrate into bolstering uh, disaster preparedness and peacekeeping activities and improved humanitarian assistance in addition to military capability. I saw this, uh, I've seen it in a number of places. Uh, I was in the Middle East um, last August with the, the chief of staff and I went he, he said that his previous trip, they went to 10 countries in 10 days, and that was just way too fast. So he and I did nine countries in nine days. I think next time we'll give, we'll give better guidance to the staff. But, but when we visited uh, Jordan, um, I, he and I visited with the, uh, the chief of the Jordanian Air Force. And uh, some of you may remember early on in the fight against ISIS that a, uh, that a Jordanian pilot um, uh, ejected over ISIS-held territory and was captured, uh, was tortured, was put in a cage, and burned alive. And they filmed it while it was going on. The commitment of the Jordanians to the fight against ISIS uh, was, was, uh, was sealed uh, in that event. But the retaliatory strike 
that involved every aircraft in the Jordanian fighter inventory was planned and led with their exchange officer, who happens to be a member of the Colorado Air National Guard. That level of deep trust that is built between the Colorado Guard and the Jordanian Air Force is something that's hard to replicate in any other way. R Rhode Island has been doing some fantastic work in Iraq and in India, supporting their development of airlift capabilities because those countries have C-130Js, just like the Rhode Island National Guard. And the Alaska Air National Guard, in coordination with the Pacific Command, has increased its engagement since 2016 to support Mongolia's newly established Air Force. Our uh, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for, uh, for International Affairs recently went to Mongolia. Mongolia has made a choice. They could have partnered with their neighbor, China, to develop their Air Force, and they didn't. They chose Alaska and the United States instead. These partnerships are going to pay off, I think, for the United States for many decades to come. The third area of co cooperation that I wanted to highlight today before taking some questions builds on our success as a country in space. Um, space, military and otherwise, really requires us to work closely with our allies, and that is true more today than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Space is, is a warfighting domain, and we, we, the United States is the best in the world at space, and our adversaries know it, and they are developing the capability to deny us the use of space in crisis or war. And we have to think about that and develop the capability to be able to defend our assets on orbit and, and be able to operate uh, through any crisis. I cannot think of any military mission that doesn't in some way depend on space in order to be successful. And that's why the National Space Strategy calls for stronger international partnerships to deter potential adversaries, to promote burden sharing, and to marshal cooperative responses to any threat. So we are building on a lot of years of cooperation to deepen our relationships with our allies and partners in space. Last month, we announced that the Air Force is going to expand opportunities for allies and partners to participate in the United States Air Force space training. We are adding two new courses to our National Security Space Institute. It's Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado. We are opening more of our current advanced courses on national security space to military members of allied countries. We have three countries that currently attend already, Australia, Canada, and the UK attend United States space training and we are inviting next year New Zealand, France, Germany, Japan, and possibly others to participate in space training in the same way that our allies have participated in pilot training for many years. This cooperation, we think, is absolutely vital um, because there's a much more dangerous and competitive security environment in space than we have faced in the past. So it is our intention to continue to work with like-minded nations in space and also in the air and, of course, on the ground. And the intention is to enhance deterrence, to defend our vital national interests, and to prevail if ever called upon to prevail. With that, Christine, I look forward to chatting with you and answering questions. How do you want to do this? Uh, you just walk over to okay. that seat over there. <clears throat> Well, Secretary Wilson, thank you so much uh, for sharing with us your views on how the Air Force is strengthening its alliances. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that strengthening alliances was one of your five priorities for the Air Force, since that's not necessarily what you would think of. Um, I wanted to start, I think, by asking you, you mentioned, you pointed out, and I think most people in this room are very familiar that the National Defense Strategy uh, envisions the department pivoting essentially from counterterrorism as its primary focus to great, basically sort of great power competition with Russia and China. 
Can you talk to us um, more broadly about how the Air Force is going to do that uh, at the same time that you also have some other pretty meaty priorities on your plate, like restoring readiness, mm -hmm. like developing exceptional leaders. That's a lot to do. And while, while I'm very envious that you all have more money than we had uh, during the time I was there in the Pentagon, it's still a lot on your plate. We do have a lot on our plate. And we cannot, you know, I think the national defense strategy recognizes the reemergence of great power competition and kind of it says we have to face this forthrightly. We have to prepare to deter and if called upon to win against in a high-end fight. We can't do that even with an increase in resources that we've been generously promised and given by the Congress. We can't do that without reducing the demand signal um, against violent extremist organizations. Be able to handle the violent extremist organization fight with lower levels of US effort in, co in collaboration with allies and partners. Uh, the light attack, uh, light attack is one example of how we're, do we're trying to do that. But unless the demand signal goes down, we can't still have 90 tanker sorties a day over the Persian Gulf and still be preparing for a high-end fight. And, and, uh, and so we've got to see that demand signal go down against violent extremism or we won't be able to accomplish the national defense strategy. Yes, and that's, in my experience, it's very hard to get that demand signal to go down. Um, combatant you know, commanders have no reason <laughs> to reduce the demand signal, I think. That's right. Whether it's combatant commanders or, frankly, whether it's the president um, from either party, I just think that leaders t uh, look at the Department of Defense and look at the U.S. military as an incredibly capable institution and an incredibly powerful set of tools. And uh, it's, it's very easy, I think, to reach for those tools. So do you, can you elaborate a little bit about how it is um, you see potentially, what are the levers or, the, or how do you turn that dial down on mm. counterterrorism operations? Is it, is it by trying to turn more to allies or are there other, other levers that you somehow see? Well, certainly uh, relying more on allies uh, is part, uh, allies and partners is, is part of it. But it, you know, and the example of the light attack is, is, uh, is really a good example. We should not be using F-35s or F-22s to go after violent extremists in pickup trucks. Um, we, there is a more cost-effective and effective way to do this, and so so that's why we uh, uh, are looking at things like light attack aircraft to be able to work. You know, it's coalition at the core. It can be uh, it can be U.S. but U.S. with partners, and you can do it at a much lower level of cost in a more permissive air environment, and and that allows us to uh, to use our high end assets to be training for the high end fight. You talked a little bit about um, what the Air Force has been doing as part of the counter-ISIS campaign. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the role the Air Force is playing in terms of trying to counter the Russians in Europe? Um, can you talk a little bit about what the Air Force is doing as part of the European Deterrence Initiative? Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, there's a number of things that are, that are part of that. Probably the most important is exercises. I think we've done, uh, the European uh, Deterrence Initiative has funded about 20 different exercises with our, with our partners and allies in Europe. Um, it does fund some things like uh, some forward deployed equipment and some forward exercises and those kinds of things, but probably uh, or forward deployments for U.S. forces, U.S. Air Forces. I think probably the most important thing is exercises because that demonstrates resolve. It also deepens the interoperability of our forces um, and our, our ability to very quickly operate together. No matter whether we're talking Pacific or European, um, the Air Force is always the stopping force. We're the ones that they want there on day one or even before day one. And so the ability to deploy forward rapidly and integrate with European forces is probably the most important thing. Can you talk a little bit, you mentioned that the um, Afghan pilots are training at, out of um, Georgia. And obviously, the Air Force has done tremendous work building up the Afghan Air Force. Uh, I think I, I read somewhere that they actually just started using laser-guided munitions on their Super Tucanos. What's your assessment of where the Afghan Air Force is now? And um, I'd be interested in your reflections on the special, I won't get it right, SIGR, which I think is the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan came out with a report very recently that was quite critical of our overall track record of stability relations or stability operations in Afghanistan. 
um, which is frankly typically kind of where SIGAR is on, on Afghanistan. But, but I'd be interested in your sense of how is progress with the Afghan Air Force in particular, and when you go over to Afghanistan and talk to airmen about the mission there, how do you um, put it in context for them about what they're doing and why it matters? I, I was in, in Afghanistan with the, the chief and I went to Afghanistan uh, um, last August. And uh, one of the things we did do was take a look at, at the, uh, and meet with the Afghan Air Force. Uh, we're training the Afghan Air Force. It's a training and advising mission, uh, not only for air operations, but also for maintenance. Uh, because you can't really have an, a, an independent air force without the ability to sustain it. It's, uh, it's A-29 attack aircraft. Um, it's a C-208 Cessna, uh, Cessna uh, um, light observation and, and, um, and cargo aircraft, uh, as well as several other different types of aircraft and helicopters now moving to the HH-60 helicopter to replace some of their Russian helicopters. Um, it is difficult. I mean, we're the first of all, some of the pilots are uh, are threatened um, uh, when they return from the United States, uh, but they are there and they're they're fighting for their country. Uh, and uh, and I thought that one of the best indications of real progress was when the Afghan airmen did not would not fire on a target because the target wasn't clear of civilian potential mm -hmm. civilian casualties. So they are exercising the kind of discretion and judgment that we expect of a professional force. Um, so, so it is tremendous capability. I think that there's a lot of work to be done. And like most security assistance work, it, is, it takes a long-term commitment of time. But, I, but they do have a capability um, as an Air Force, and I think the prospect of be, being an independent and decisive force. Um, speaking of uh, airstrikes and civilian casualties, that's another issue that's been in the news quite a bit, even in the context of the United States and Britain in particular and the work we've done in the Middle East. Are you concerned about um, the, are you concerned at all about the concern over civilian casualties being something that may be fueling terrorism and and if any of that backlash may potentially threaten the department's ability to hold on to unmanned airstrikes as an important tool in the fight against terrorism. One of the things that, uh, that really has changed, and I noticed it, so I had been away from national security for about almost a decade, really, when I came back to be Secretary of the Air Force. And one of the things that really struck me um, was how Exquisite intelligence combined with precision strike from the air had changed the game in support of Iraq, Iraq indigenous Iraqi forces fighting against ISIS. It was stunning. And, and uh, we are so precise with air power now. Uh, I, was, uh, I was in the command center when, the day that the, uh, that the fight launched to take back Talafar. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, there was an F-15 that was uh, uh, that was going to uh, support Iraqis in the field that were pinned down, and they they knew exactly the house that uh, that fire was coming from, and the weaponeers calculating the the uh, the minimum size munition that would take out that house and not any of the ones around it, and they are so precise that they can now say, I want this wall to fall to the left and not the right. If you compare the amount of precision we have today um, with even what we had 20 years ago, let alone what we were doing from you know, B-17s and B-24s in the Second World War, it is amazing. And, and the neat, one of the neat things about that center was obviously on the day of a launch of an operation, it's, it's, there's a certain tension in the room, there's a lot going on, there's weapon ears, there's a, it's an F-15 who has munitions on his wing, he's got five more minutes of gas before he has to go off sta station. There are ground forces employed in a fight who are waiting for help. And in the middle of all of that controlled, activity, which looked to some people maybe like chaos, there is a captain who is a judge advocate general who looks at the commander um, who's running that operation and gives him the thumbs up that that is a clear target and a legitimate target to hit. That's bringing 
You know, that's bringing the American values to the fight. I completely agree, and certainly I saw when I was uh, in the Pentagon that same incredible both commitment to that precision, but also the ability to execute uh, almost always with that precision. But there still is a lot of um, controversy about what the real level of civilian casualties are, and uh, and I know even myself, I, I um, saw some reporting after I left government that caused me to question a little bit whether we were doing everything we could to report on, to, to sort of dig in and, and make sure that civilian casualties were as low as we wanted them to be. Why do you think we continue to have difficulty persuading um, people on the outside how committed we are to that? And do you think we're doing everything we can to try to you know, investigate the claims of civilian casualties? Well, first of all, our adversaries have an interest and, and, uh, uh, in perhaps saying things that aren't true. Um, but uh, perhaps um, it, um, as important, war is a terrible thing. It is not the most terrible of things. And, uh, and uh, for, for the United States and for probably all countries, um, moving quickly and making sure that this is over as quickly as possible um, and that we try to restore um, peace in the wake of war is, uh, is probably the best thing we can always do. But there, there's no question. The war is an absolutely awful thing, and innocent people um, are, uh, are affected by it. You talked in your remarks about uh, everything the Air Force is doing in space. We had General Neller here a couple weeks ago, and he talked a little bit about some of the concerns he had on how reliant we are on GPS and on networked operations. Mm -hmm. um, if he were here and you were talking to him about those concerns, what, what would you say? Uh, one of the things that you are, probably have talked to him, yeah, I'm yeah. guessing. <laughs> um, the, uh, and it gets back to uh, uh, just how interoperable we are now and how every mission depends on space in some way. Um, one of the things I think is a, in our fiscal year 19 budget proposal, there's a couple of things that are, that are really big shifts for us. And one of them is the acceleration of defendable space. And, you know, we built, with respect to space, we've been good at, we, we've been the best in the world at this since the 1950s. But we built a glass house in the era before stones. So we now have other countries that are challenging us and would seek to deny us the use of space. And satellites, we have, the Air Force runs 90% of what's in space for the Defense Department is Air Force. And then we have 77 satellites. So it's not a lot. But they're very vulnerable, and satellites don't like to be rattled or shaken, or they're pretty fragile kind of things. They're not, they're, they're, they're not built to be robust. Um, but we, we now are in a situation where we have to try to make that architecture survive. Um, somebody trying to mess with it. And, uh, and so uh, we canceled some of our, our big, um, slow target kinds of satellites for, uh, for uh, missile warning. We canceled them. Um, and we're accelerating um, a, a new missile warning. Uh, it's our infrared satellites is what they are, uh, that are uh, that are maneuverable, that have the ability to defend themselves to some to some extent. Um, we're also moving to the next generation of GPS satellites that are jam resistant. The biggest challenge for GIN, different satellite constellations have different challenges or different potential vulnerabilities. For GPS, which is the one most Americans are most familiar with because it's the blue dot on your phone, um, it is, uh, it's a constellation of 33 satellites. And if you can see any four of them at any one time, you, can, you know where you are on the world within about a meter or a, or a yard. Um, and uh, and so, so the biggest challenge to GPS is not knocking the satellites down, it's just jamming the signal, because it's really a very weak signal that's coming to your phone. Um, so, so we're moving to jam-resistant GPS for, uh, for, military, for military use. So, so there's a number of different things we're doing with respect to uh, GPS. Moving to jam-resistant GPS is probably the most important. Um, but being able, you know, all of our operations, uh, the, the uh, we still practice uh, as if GPS were not available. We still teach pilots how to navigate using a map. Um, and uh, the uh, Marine Corps does the same thing on the ground. Um, you still have to expect that the adversary is going to deny you those tools that are, that are, uh, that are the, the most fun to use in peacetime. 
Okay, um, why don't we open it to questions? I know you have a hard stop, and so if we've got questions in our audience, there should be microphones circulating. Please just uh, raise your hand. Okay, um, the woman here in the middle row, sort of. Hi, ma'am. Valerie Ensign with Defense News. Um, so it's almost June. Um, I was wondering when we could expect to see some sort of a decision on the TX program and the Huey replacement program, because I think Huey was slated to be decided in June, TX sometime this summer, and so we're nearing that. Is it still on track? With respect to the Huey replacement, I think, as you know, there was a protest pre uh, before the request, before the proposals were even submitted, we had a company protest, um, I, which is amazing to me. But the General Accounting Office just denied that protest. That uh, that protest denial was uh, was received on the 23rd of May. So we are now moving forward with getting the proposals in on uh, replacing replacing the Huey. Um, the uh, the other one was TX. Is that right? Uh, so the next generation trainer that will replace the T-38 for the Air Force. As I understand it, we're still on track to make that decision this summer. Um, but uh, they've got all the proposals in, and they're in the proposal evaluation phase. I intentionally don't ask the specifics for, uh, for um, evaluation of proposals, but they've told me that they're on time for a summer decision. So summer means when? June, July, maybe August. Um, it's this summer. We're going to try to not let that slip too much because we know we need to get the Hueys replaced. Um, but we we did get a get a, um, a a delay of people turning in their proposals, and uh, that was just uh, the 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 uh, protest was denied. Other questions, sir, and then you. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, uh, Jim Holmes, retired Foreign Service, and. Um, uh, a private consultant. Um, Turkey, uh, a, a NATO ally, uh, has recently agreed, not too recently, has agreed to uh, buy an air defense system for the Russians, the S-400. Uh, what sort of alliance and operational problems does that present? That does present some operational problems that we're, uh, we're discussing with Turkey and the State Department as the lead on that, as well as the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Um, particularly uh, as it relates to the to the location of of advanced aircraft in Turkey that are members of the NATO alliance or even American aircraft like the F-35 that Turkey is a partner in the F-35, um, but uh, we would we would not want to to have uh, that aircraft um, close to uh, the S-400, and so those discussions are going on with Turkey um, and. Uh, and uh, I think that we are hopeful that that can be resolved uh, before they would take delivery of that aircraft into Turkey itself. An alliance problem? I'm sorry? An alliance problem as well? Does it present a problem for the alliance, NATO alliance? I, uh, no, I don't think, I don't, I don't connect those problems directly with the, with the NATO alliance. We always want our allies to have equipment that's interoperable and that doesn't pose a threat. We've had this in other places, but sometimes it's the United States that's part of the problem. We've got some of our allies that are trying to purchase unmanned aerial vehicles, for example, for remotely piloted aircraft. We won't sell them ours because of export controls, and so we force them into a situation where they want to buy uh, unmanned aircraft or even intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance aircraft that are, that are built by China. Well, that creates problem. And so, so we need to, you know, sometimes we need to figure out how to be better allies and do you know, things like we're trying to do with the light attack aircraft, build things that are in designed to be exportable from the very beginning so that we can all operate out the same equipment rather than create problems for, a, for an American aircraft sitting on a ramp next to a Chinese-built intelligence surveillance and a, a reconnaissance aircraft. That doesn't work. And so, so some of it's our own fault and we've got to fix it. I think you had a question right here in the front. Herb Rose, uh, I don't know if you had occasion to watch 60 Minutes over this uh, past weekend. They ran a story about fratricide in Afghanistan where a group of soldiers was pinned down, they called in, uh, for uh, uh, air support and uh, the soldiers were provided with 
uh, I believe, IR strobe units uh, and were under the impression that the Air Force plane that came uh, to uh, wipe out the resistance there um, had a detection system which detected the strobe uh, units, which it did not. Uh, and as a result, uh, a number of soldiers were killed because of it. Uh, in other words, the uh, air support attacked the soldiers rather than the resistance there. Uh, do you know if uh, these planes, and I think they were said C-17, but I could be wrong, uh, now are provided with uh, the detection systems which can detect uh, the strobes uh, on the ground? Uh, I did not see the 60-minute the, uh, story, but I am familiar with that case, which was quite a few years ago now. Um, um, that it happened, and I, I've actually read a summary of that of that particular case, and it, it's actually you know um, it, it's not as simple as the as the IRR the infrared detector. It was uh, there's always confusion in combat. The uh, the um, they called in the coordinates of where the Americans were not where the enemy True. was. They and did make they a point of that there. in the story, too. So, and they confirmed it several, it was just a terrible, terrible thing. Um, uh, it was awful. But it wasn't particularly, it wasn't specifically technical. That would have, that's one of the things that would have prevented, um, that would have been a final indicator to the, to, the, to the pilots of those aircraft that those were allied forces on the ground. But there were more fundamental problems there. Um, that they called in and confirmed the coordinates multiple times, and they were calling them in on themselves. Secretary Wilson, I think that you have a hard stop at four, and it is four. Uh, so while I know there are many other questions left in the audience, we are out of time. Can everyone please join me in a round of applause for Secretary Wilson? Thank you.